Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's 1230. I, we'll get started. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, uh, Developments in Privacy and Data Security for Nonprofits. I'll briefly introduce our panelists in a second. Uh, I'm George Constantine. I'm with the nonprofit practice here at Venable. I'd like to welcome you all here in person and those participating uh, via webinar. Uh, we, we do these uh, once a month-ish. You know, we've been doing it once a month pretty regularly recently and, um, um, and really are excited to have such a good crowd here and, and on the phone. And um, just by way of pitching the next one, on April 9th, we'll have a program titled um, Navigating the Universe of Employee Medical Leave in D.C., uh, which should promise to be a, a good discussion of some very recent and important developments for employers, particularly here uh, in the district. Uh, so um, you should have received an invite uh, for that, and if you haven't, let us know, and we'll get one to you. Um, so for today's program, just briefly to introduce our, our speakers, um, at my far left, your right, is Jesse Rabin, and Jesse is the general counsel to the Common Application, a 501c3 membership organization that's committed to the pursuit of access, equity, and integrity in the college admission process. Those of you recently out of college or those of you with children uh, in college age probably know the Common App, and our, our children certainly welcome that, Jesse, by the way, uh, to s save on time on filling out those applications. Um, before joining uh, as general counsel of the Common App, uh, Jesse served as associate general counsel of the American Psychological Association. He was in the, the office of the general counsel for 18 years at American Psychological Association. Uh, Jesse's been a, a, a great contributor to the nonprofit community for a number of years, serving on the American the Association of Corporate Councils Nonprofit Committee and working with ASAE on programs. And so uh, thanks for, for giving of your time to us as well today, Jesse. Next to me, next to Jesse, is Kelly DeMarcus Bestide. Just, she's a partner here at Venable working in our um, renowned uh, privacy and data security practice and has worked with a number of our clients in the nonprofit space on getting them compliant with um, federal, international, uh, state regulations related to uh, privacy and data security. Um, Kelly has, has worked here at Venable for, I'm guessing, 10 years, but more. Yeah, great. Um, and, and has, as I said, in addition to just working as, as, a, as a lawyer in the privacy and data security practice, has developed a unique subspecialty working with, with um, our, our clients here in the nonprofit and trade association world. So you're in for a great uh, presentation today. Uh, if you do have questions when they come up, please note here in, in person that we've got microphones and, and we ask you to please ask a question at the microphone so that the people on the webinar can hear. With that, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Thank you, George. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us both in the room and on the phone and uh, I think we have a good crowd because as a lot of you probably recognize this is a really critical time for privacy and security issues. It's one of the uh, most rapidly evolving areas of law I think and presents certainly a variety of challenges that we've been privileged to help many of you uh, navigate. And right now we're facing a, a time of sea change kind of led by the implementation and effectiveness of the GDPR last year in 2018 for any of you who went through a GDPR compliance exercise, um, I'm guessing it was eye-opening as you got your hands around all of the things that your organizations were doing with data, the things that your marketing and business folks wanted to do. Um, and that was really, you know, part of the purpose of that exercise. Um, now, in 2019, we're seeing the United States following suit, led by California and the California Consumer Privacy Act, or the CCPA, which we'll talk about in some detail um, as, as part of today's presentation. Uh, California is really unique because it's the first time that we're moving away from the U.S. sectoral privacy framework. Our approach has always been to regulate specific data uses or data types, um, things like HIPAA for health data or GLBA for financial data, and to regulate those channels. California is, is the first true comprehensive data privacy and security somewhat, but mostly privacy law that we're seeing. And um, as we'll talk about, a lot of other U.S. states are looking to follow suit. And then there's some activity on the federal level as well in reaction to California. So we're seeing a lot of interesting and innovative proposals around U.S. privacy right now. Um, I believe the California Attorney General just two weeks ago talked about a data dividend, uh, which would be giving folks money back for use of their data. And then we promptly saw that uh, in draft legislation the next week in Washington state. So it's a time when we're really seeing the legislative picture be very reactive. 
uh, in response. So we really hope to provide you all with some thoughts about what we see the privacy and security landscape looking like, how it's going to shape up through this year, um, and things to think about as you continue to think about the data practices of your organization. Uh, I am delighted to be joined by Jesse today. And um, Jesse, can you tell us a little bit about the Conlin application just to just to set the table for the group? Sure. So the uh, common application, uh, as George mentioned, you know, we're a nonprofit member organization. Uh, kids now apply online to college. And when they apply, they give us their most sensitive data at the most sensitive time of their life and probably even more sensitive for their parents because the stress and anxiety is is very high. So uh, we have to be a very trusted place uh, for for their data. Um, uh, we recently brought in uh, another group in a, an acquisition in January, uh, Michelle Obama's Reach Hire program, uh, whose main focus really is to go after the low-income and first-generation students uh, that are out there that are creating accounts on our system but are not applying. And we're, we're looking at about six or 800,000 students out there that create the account but, but don't apply. There's another large subset that um, uh, go ahead and apply get admitted but never show up. Um, we're holding all of that data. We want to make sure it's locked down. We want to make sure that we're, uh, we're complying with the GDPR and also, although we're not, um, we don't have to with the California law because we're a nonprofit, my guess is that will probably change in, in, the, in the future, so. Thank you. Um, okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you what I know, but Jesse really sits in your shoes and delighted to have the benefit of his insight. So today's agenda has four general parts. We're going to start with an update on what's happening in Europe with the GDPR, uh, kind of nine months in. And also, that's really going to be an update on the global privacy landscape. Um, we're going to talk briefly about the California Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA. Uh, Jesse stole the line. It is not applicable to nonprofits, but um, we're going to tell you a little bit about it because there are some things you might need to navigate there anyway. Uh, we're going to look at other U.S. privacy laws and proposals, uh, mostly in reaction to the CCPA, and then talk a little bit about data breach. Um, and as George mentioned, we welcome questions in the room throughout. Happy to take them as we go. But uh, folks on the webinar, if you could hold them to the end, we'll try to answer as many as we can. Okay, so um, GDPR became effective on May 25th, 2018. So we are about nine months in. And there's some interesting learnings to share from what's happening in Europe. So kind of four broad topics to talk about. Um, the first is uh, guidance and more information on extraterritorial applicability. So what was so unique about the GDPR and what brought in so many organizations that weren't covered by existing European data protection laws is it had new rules related to extraterritorial applicability. So the GDPR expressly says that if you have an establishment, i.e. a physical presence in Europe, you're caught. But if you don't have an establishment, you're caught if you offer goods or services to individuals in the EU or you monitor the behavior of individuals in the EU online. And it's really that offering of goods or services prong that brought so many U.S. organizations and companies under European data protection law where they hadn't had to comply before. Um, we knew from the text of the regulation that merely having a web page that was globally accessible was not enough. But we didn't know much more than that. And um, I think there were a lot of misconceptions in the marketplace that, okay, if we have a web page that we know folks from Europe because we use Google Analytics, we know they're visiting it, we have to do GDPR. Or we know that we have some members from Europe, although we're kind of a U.S.-focused organization, we have European members or European attendees at our trade shows, do we have to do GDPR? And there was a lot of question and uncertainty around kind of how much EU personal data was enough to tip you over the line and what kinds of activities were enough um, to cross this threshold of offering goods or services. So long-awaited guidance from the, the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board, they're the, the new body who gets to issue binding guidance, that came out um, right at the end of last year. And it kind of made a couple things clear. So it talked about um, that GDPR offering goods or services is really a test of intent. And it's a fact-specific test that looks at whether or not your organization um, are doing things to attract a European audience. So if you 
inadvertently have some European members or folks that come to your conferences or shows, that may not be enough. It's only if you're affirmatively marketing towards a European audience that you have to begin to be concerned about GDPR. Um, I know we fielded a lot of questions like we're not soliciting donations from Europe, but we have them. You know, what should we do about that? Do we have to cut that off? We don't want to stop people from sending us money if they want to. And this guidance is helpful in the sense that it provides a lot of um, examples that might help flesh out some of these ideas and make them more clear uh, in your mind. But it did reinforce uh, the advice that we discussed, if, if you came to this panel last year, the idea really that you have to be doing something affirmative towards the European market in order to cross uh, the GDPR threshold. Ooh, I'm good. Okay. Um, the next thing to discuss are data processing agreements or DPAs. So for any of you who are unfortunately in the GDPR zone, one of the requirements uh, is to enter into a DPA or data processing addendum with all of your service providers or as they're known data processors um, when this organ when this kind of activity started uh, early last year there were a lot of questions around what the market positions were uh, any of you who've negotiated a DPA you know one of the required terms for example is that uh, you have to get notice of any subprocessors, so any service providers to your service providers, and you have the ability to consent or to reject those service providers. Well, there was a lot of negotiation and haggling back and forth, and can we just get a blanket consent in the DPA so that we never have to reach out to you again? A lot of those questions have been, for the most part, resolved, just because there's a lot more experience with DPAs. I think a lot of your service providers you'll see have, at this point now, developed a process by which they send out um, a mass notification that they're adding a subprocessor. Uh, another area where we've seen a market position emerge really is around the idea of breach notification. So as you know, if you are the primary uh, entity who's been breached, you have to provide notice within 72 hours to your regulator, your supervisory authority as they're known under the GDPR. But um, your DPA will require your service provider, if they're the ones who suffer the breach, to provide notice to you first. So we saw a lot of service providers trying to rely on vague language, like we'll give you notice as soon as practicable or promptly. Um, and I think it's now become far more common for service providers to accept a 24-hour notice provision in recognition of the fact that your own obligation is triggered within 72 hours. So you need it within 24, sometimes 36 hours. And that's a market position, again, where we're seeing just less negotiation and kind of um, more general acceptance of that position. The other one, and this is a question we get a lot, are limitations of liability and indemnity. So... Um, as a data controller, first party under GDPR, you are fully financially liable for any um, unlawful acts by your data processors, full stop. And as everyone knows, the GDPR brings up to a 4% worldwide annual revenue penalty for breaches of the law. So um, we're seeing service providers commonly accept indemnity provisions to try to shift some of that liability. And in fact, we're seeing a lot of market positions around what we're calling super caps. So if they want a cap, it's not a cap to just, you know, a year's worth of fees, but more like a $20 million cap, super cap we're seeing as being relatively acceptable on the marketplace. You'll still get pushback, but there's now some support that you can marshal um, if you're pushing for that kind of cap with any of your service providers who are really crucial. So um, this emergence of market positions is helping to streamline the DPA process um, and make these agreements kind of more uniform throughout the market. And, and with this, I mean, <clears throat> I'm certainly not an expert in this, and I rely on, on outside counsel. You know, to me, when one comes in, uh, the first question in my mind, and I'm sure many other people's mind, am I a controller, am I a processor, I think – you know, getting a stance in place before these come in and try to understand what you can give on and what you can't give on and exactly what you're, what you're defined as in the market, I think is incredibly important. So when, when somebody asks you a question or when you're trying to negotiate this, you at least seem to know what you're talking about. Otherwise, I would, I would absolutely be relying on outside counsel um, to, uh, to, to take the ball on these. Okay. Um, 
Also, more guidance from the EDPB. They are the body. They are comprised of the data protection commissioners from each of the EEA countries. Um, they meet monthly. They answer questions about how to implement the law, and they do issue guidance from time to time. So if anyone is kind of keeping score, they have now issued guidance this year on um, data transfer, which is a thorny question for the nonprofit world. How do you move data from the EU to the United States if you can't rely on the Privacy Shield, which is a mechanism that's available only to U.S. Uh, for-profit companies. Um, also, codes of conduct and certifications. So this is a, a claim I hear made a lot in this space. Oh, we're GDPR certified. That is actually not a thing. So if you're talking to a service <laughs> provider who claims that, just stop talking to them. Um, but it will be a thing at some point in the future. So the regulation allows for certification regimes, codes of conduct that would you know, offer some kind of seal of approval around certain practices. <clears throat> None have been recognized to date, of which I'm aware, um, but there is guidance out there that kind of allows these certification bodies to move forward in developing something. So I think there will be certifications at some point in the relatively near future, but uh, none exists right now, so don't fall for that claim if you hear it. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to provide a brief update on the e-privacy regulation. This is the regulation, it's separate. So the GDPR, um, replaced what was called the 95 Directive, which was current EU law, and made a single uniform law across you know, the EEA member states. Uh, E-privacy was in the same boat. This is the law that's responsible for those cookie banners that um, nobody likes, really. It is the regulation that sets forth the rules for consent around electronic communication. So it gets attention because of the cookie banners, because that was its innovation. But it also regulates email and telemarketing. Um, and other forms of, all forms of electronic communication. It remains uh, country by country. There was supposed to be a new e-privacy regulation that would take the old one, bring it up to the standard of the GDPR, harmonize it, and create a single regime across Europe. And that is uh, utterly mired in the legislative process in the EU. So it was promised first a companion to become effective also in May 2018. That didn't happen. And then it was supposed to be before the end of the calendar year in May 2018. That hasn't happened. And in fact, they have not released a discussion draft since before Thanksgiving of last year. And there are some factors in play, like they have a presidency that turns over once a year. It turned over at the beginning of this year. So essentially, they have to start again every 12 months with the negotiation unless they make real substantive process. Um, substantive progress throughout the process, which they haven't done. One of the reasons is that it would dramatically expand uh, what it covers. So not just email and telemarketing and cookie banners, but also the Internet of Things, um, VoIP technology like Skype. They essentially want to regulate all forms of electronic communication, even machine to machine, so things that don't uh, impact individuals. And they set forth consent rules. Um, and the drafts that we've seen, <laughs> they recognize that no one likes the cookie banners and they would wholesale eliminate them, but they would be looking to replace them with something else. It's just stuck. I don't, you know, they, they continue to say it might come out this year. I find that very hard to believe. Um, so right now, cookie banners remain good law, but there is still country-specific um, variation between things like email consent. So GDPR provides one set of rules, um, existing e-privacy presents another, and there is a, a gap between them, uh, which sometimes you can re rely on to your benefit. So e-privacy, for example, the way it's implemented in the UK says B2B emails are opt out. Uh, you can continue to take that position. There's some legal risk, but e-privacy gives you some cover there. So it's something to be aware of because it will have more material impact on things like marketing, actually, than the GDPR did because the rules are more specific. Just really quickly, um, you had mentioned um, the issue of data transfer from the EU to the, to the U.S. Um, we recently ran into an issue the other way, and in, we were looking for kind of practical advice. Somebody had contacted us. They had created an account on our system seven or eight years ago, through, and it was basically it was off-site in an old system, and they wanted a copy of all of their data from, you know, seven, eight years ago. And we were trying to figure out, okay, A, is this person who they say they are, because we don't want to just 
give data to somebody just because they're making the request. So how do you make sure that they're the right person? And then what are the proper ways to actually transfer the data over? And I don't know if you want to touch on touch on that. Yeah, sure. So there's a couple issues at play there in this example. One is this idea of when you get requests for data that you have to honor under GDPR, how do you verify who the person who the person is and if they are who they say they are? Um, you know, Jesse's organization, you hold a lot of data about people. Um, they might be sensitive because they were children at the time that they submitted it. So um, what the guidance says is that you can employ measures to verify identity. Um, you can actually collect more data in order to verify the identity of an individual. Um, but the way it works is loosely a sliding scale where you're supposed to calibrate how many hoops you make someone jump to through um, against the sensitivity of the data that you're going to provide. So if you're a bank, for example, it makes perfect sense to require copies of two forms of government ID and a utility bill, right? That's a pretty burdensome request from the individual. If you're a retailer and all you have is, you know, some transaction data and no financial data, it may be fine just to say, oh, that's the name and email address that we have on file. Um, you know, tell me what your physical address is. That matches where we've shipped the packages. Here's the data. And it's a, a far less burdensome inquiry. So that's something as part of a GDPR compliance exercise your organization has to come to ground on. And also, you know, what do you do if folks don't have government IDs, if that's what you're requiring? Um, because you're not allowed to deny the request. You have to kind of play out, play it out. Um, you can't just, you know, simply deny it. I think you have to be a bit flexible. Okay, so um, what are we seeing from the DPAs, the data protection authorities who are enforcing the GDPR? They are, quite frankly, overwhelmed. And some stats that came out of their last meeting in February. Um, so Germany is, is unique in the fact that each of their um, states has their own DPA. They're the only country like that. So one of their DPAs in the Hess saw a 1,200% increase in complaints and breach reporting. And they flat out said, we can't actually answer them. So if you submit a complaint, you will get a, an auto reply that says, thank you. You will hear, hear back in three months' time. And he's like, hopefully we respond back in three months' time. He was pretty frank about that. Um, Ireland, they have received almost 2,800 breach reports in 2017 um, and over 4,000 since the GDPR went into effect. Um, and it's really interesting because the mantra out of these DPAs was, well, if you have a breach, you know, you have a 72-hour timeline to report it. We get You might not have all the information. When in doubt, just report it. Put your marker down. And the, um, the Irish DPA, Helen Dixon, the commissioner, said, we don't want you to do that anymore because we actually have a bottleneck. We can't just even read the ones that are coming in. And it's interesting, if any of you suffer, suffer a breach that is arguably reportable under the GDPR, I know nobody likes to report anything to a regulator, but the stories we're hearing and some of the stats are coming out are saying, you're not going to get investigated because they actually can't. <laughs> they physically can't report everybody. So if you have a, you know, a, an HR breach where um, you have like 22 of your employees had their email mailbox broken into or something along those lines, you're not going to be investigated. I would be um, as certain as I'm allowed to say that they will not come back and investigate you. But um, I also thought this was really funny. Yeah, they were complaining. They said it was law firms who were ginning up. Um, all of the interest in the GDPR, not them, uh, and that they thought that, that it, was, it was lawyers who were causing all the problems. Um, the German DPA also said, she said, we have this 4% authority, uh, but I don't feel like I have any more power because for me to get uh, monetary penalties, I have to go to court, and my office just doesn't have the time to do that, really. So... Um, we're really not going to employ monetary penalties except in the most egregious cases. Uh, consistent with what we've heard and also what they said, if, they, if there is an investigation, they will ask for your record of data processing activities. There's a requirement in the GDPR that you have to have this record of processing. It has to be kept up to date. Um, if any of you did a data map, you probably would have converted your data map into this record of processing. So that's what they're going to ask for, and they're going to send you some interrogatories and request some information. So it's really important to have that record of processing uh, maintained and up to date. You don't want to be scrambling to kind of pull that together. 
Okay, but we do have one enforcement action um, that has, it's the first uh, application of the 4% fining authority. And this uh, is from February of this year. Google was fined 50 million euros in France, it's roughly equivalent, I believe, to $57 million for violations of GDPR. Um, they, the CANIL, that's the French authority, alleged two things. So they allege violation of GDPR rules around transparency and consent. And specifically, they didn't say that um, the Google, the information that Google provided was uh, incorrect or incomplete. What they said was it was spread over a variety of different privacy policies and terms of use. So as a consumer, you could figure out what Google was doing with your data, but you had to click around and look at a half dozen different locations. So it was the form that mattered, not as much as the substance. Um, something else that I personally think is really interesting from this, there was a lot of talk about the GDPR as a uniform law. There's this one-stop shop. Investigations will be coordinated so you don't face them from multiple states. And this was the first test of that, and uh, it failed. So what they said was, um, you know, you're supposed to have a lead regulator. And again, if any of you have gone through this exercise, you may have nominated your lead. The lead is probably where you have an office in Europe, if you have one, or it's supposed to be the location where your data processing activities are centralized. And what they said about Google, they're headquartered in Ireland. Um, the French authority went to Ireland and said, do you want to head this up? And they said, you know, they have an office here, but they're actually processing the data in the United States. So based on our substantive understanding of their activities, there actually is no lead for Google in Europe. Um, so any, it's fair game. Anybody can go after them. So France went after them alone. So uh, it's, it's an interesting reminder that I think in a true investigation, they will look behind the documentation and you know what your privacy policy says and actually look for substance behind where where's the action happening? Where's the data being held? Where's it being processed? Um, France has really led the way. This is the fifth enforcement action from the French DPA. It's the first one where they've levied financial penalties. Uh, they had four specifically around um, advertising companies all last fall before the holidays. In each of those, they didn't levy penalties, um, but what they did was they required them to cure by essentially deleting their entire database and collecting data fresh under um, consent and at the level of the GDPR. So uh, Google's appealing, no surprise, um, and we'll see how this one develops. And I, I will note on this, um, <clears throat> when I was at the APA and um, we're about to go through it uh, where I am now at Common App, uh, looking at our privacy policy um, and trying to look at others best practices. I know LinkedIn, for instance, will have kind of the whole legalese on one side, and then on the right-hand side of the page, they just have a couple very plain English, here's what it really means. So in my mind, it's <clears throat> I want to take that practice and, and do that at the Common App, and we're going to embark on that over the next few months to really put it down into plain English, because even for me to have to read through just the pages of what our privacy policy is. My eyes glaze over, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with it, but I start to get tripped up and I can't imagine, you know, I, I have to imagine it's the same for, for pretty much everybody else out there, much less somebody who's coming and visiting your, your website. Uh, when I saw LinkedIn's approach, I thought it was just a very clear way of, of attacking uh, and explaining to, to the public exactly what was going on. For the record, I didn't write Jesse's privacy policy. <laughs> <laughs> One other place where we're really seeing GDPR flex, it's not on the slide, but um, it's actually the German Antitrust Authority has gone after Facebook. And it, it's an interesting action where they said their model, their entire business model, is illegal. It bundles um, having to provide data with, ex with um, getting the service. And they're saying that's an antitrust violation, not a GDPR violation. Um, but it's a little bit of a flex, kind of using the principles of the GDPR and going after them uh, in another way. So that's another one we're sort of keeping our keeping our eye on to see what happens. Okay. So just as a reminder to everybody here, you know, it was very common in the flurry of activity in May of 2018 to say, okay, we're going to do our privacy policy. We're going to do the consent language on our web page. We know we need some policies and stuff. We'll do that later. And then everybody, you know, breathed a sigh of relief, went on vacation, 
and forgot about the GDPR. So there are some things that may remain outstanding if you've gone through this exercise, especially around internal policies. Um, make sure that they've been implemented because you may be asked to produce them uh, at some, in some case. You know, I think Jesse's example about old databases was really instructive. You're supposed to have data deletion in place um, around GDPR. I know a lot of organizations hold on to things forever. We're all data hoarders. Um, and you know what? You get that request, all of a sudden you're digging around in data that's eight years old and it's in a different format and you're trying to figure out how to export it. It also just raises the risk if you have a, a breach of your systems. It's data that you're not getting any kind of business use from that's just sitting there. Get rid of it. If that was the idea in 2018, make sure that it really happened. Um, check your consent. If you updated your consent, dust it off. If you're trying to do new things under the same consent, make sure that it's up to date. If you're printing new membership applications or updating your website, that's a great time to just double check the legalese that's there. And, um, you know, GDPR was really a holistic organizational exercise. Marketing had a role, IT had a role, your, your um, membership folks had a role. Make sure they all did what was on their to-do lists. Um, so it persists on, unfortunately. And, and I'll add, um, with this, the in terms of um, uh, data being deleted, um, when I was just leaving APA we, and, and GDPR was coming online, we got these automatic requests that were coming through, um, and it kind, of, it, it kind of blew my mind because people were handing over their email accounts to a service. The service would comb through the email and find, according to whatever algorithm, uh, companies that, that the algorithm believed um, was holding data. And so we were getting these random emails, and the language is pretty much exactly the same in each one. And so we, what we decided to do immediately was just respond, you know, is this what you really want? You want us to delete your data? And several people came back and said, oh, no, 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 I just tried this new system, and I guess you got caught in the web. I don't want you to delete my data. So I think it's important to, to, to kind of check and be sure that that's what's going on. Um, when I moved over, we were in the middle of a, of a litigation, and of course GDPR hits, and we start to get these deletion requests um, from, I guess, anxious students and parents. Um, and we had to kind of go through an exercise as to what to do um, when you're under a, a litigation hold. And we just made the decision that we were responding back to everybody who was making the request, saying, we'll get to it when we can. We're letting you know that we're under a litigation hold. We're not allowed to delete anything. But once we get out of the litigation, um, then we're happy to go back and review and have this discussion with you and, and see what we can to delete. We just got out of the litigation, so now we've got our work cut out for us. We've got a couple hundred deletion requests that we need to sit down uh, in the next few weeks. Um, actually, once the judge enters the, the order that the case is dismissed, um, then we can go back through and, and, and move through the deletion requests. That's a really smart approach, too, because you have to provide some response within 30 days. The failure to provide any response at all is is a violation. Um, but there are many exceptions to deletion. And one is if you have, you know, a legal reason why you need to keep it. So you did the right thing by invoking that legal reason. And now it's no longer going to be there once you have your final order. And then you do have to circle back and make sure that the requests are fulfilled. Um, okay. So away from GDPR, but still in Europe, a uh, question I've been getting a lot is what's going to happen with Brexit? Um, so if anybody's following the news, they are looking to enter into uh, a deal by uh, March 29th this month. And there are sort of two scenarios from a, a privacy perspective as to what's going to happen. So if they reach the deal that the UK is looking for, there will be a uh, transition period that goes to the end of 2020. During that period, the UK will simply follow the GDPR. So for any of you who were including the UK in your countries, nothing to change there. Um, that means data will continue to flow freely between the UK and other um, European countries. Um, during that time, the UK will seek what's called adequacy. So this is a finding that the European Commission does where they look at the laws of another country and they say, oh, they're equivalent to ours. Therefore, you can move data freely back and forth between uh, GDPR covered countries and this other country. So the UK will seek that kind of finding. Unclear whether they'll get it before 2020, but I'm sure there would be some political pressure to put it in place. 
And during this time, uh, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, who's their regulator, they will continue to be active participants in GDPR level activities, including um, the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board. If there is no deal, uh, the UK said they'll essentially, they have a law that automatically will pass on March 29th that is their version of the GDPR, but it won't be the GDPR, it'll be the UK's version. And there's a draft that exists of that. Um, however, data will flow under their law from the UK to other European countries, but not the other way around. So if you're moving data um, from France or Spain or Italy or Norway, um, and centralizing it in London or your London office is accessing it, you will have to put a mechanism in place to move that data legally, just like when you move it to the United States. So the UK will be outside of the, the GDPR data transfer bubble. Again, the UK will seek adequacy for their law, timing uncertain, and um, the UK ICO 700 staffers will be removed from the EDPB. So that's you know, less enforcement. That's a lot of manpower that that, that that board is going to lose. But it also loses the UK. They don't have a say anymore in how the GDPR is interpreted. And they've long been seen as kind of the most US-friendly, business-friendly country in Europe. So kind of a loss for everybody. Um, we'll have to wait and see. I think there's even more talks today, but no final decisions on that. And just to touch on the rest of the globe, this is a reminder that uh, the rest of the world continues to move on privacy, both comprehensive legislation. Brazil came online last <laughs> September, I believe. Uh, we see cybersecurity, a lot of data localization out of China, uh, Russia, where there's even criminal penalties for storing data outside of the jurisdiction. Um, we see kind of marketing specific things like Castle. This is the Canadian law that required everybody to get consent for emails a couple years ago. They're uh, in the process of updating that again, probably to broaden the technologies that it covers. Um, Japan, they received that adequacy determination from the European authorities um, just uh, last month, I believe. So they now essentially have the GDPR in place. And my understanding is South Korea is in the process of doing that as well. So if you apply the GDPR as a global standard, it will serve you well in most countries outside of the United States. That was going to be my question. How do you like, comply with all when, you know, when you're sitting uh, you know, in-house and you've got you know, 15 other issues that you're dealing with and then you're looking at this list? Yeah. You know, what is the... What can you take care of to make sure that you're as in compliance as you possibly can be with all of these uh, laws that are coming online? Yeah, it's a really it's a really tough question. And, you know, we always advise you can't do every country, every law. But if you have a concentration of individuals who you are members or offer services to or you get a lot of donations from, you should probably make an effort to look at the country specific laws there uh, just from a risk management perspective. Okay, so California, the CCPA. Um, this is really like the hot privacy topic of 2019. So it's an interesting story how we got here. Um, and it involves a, a bit of an eccentric California millionaire named Alistair McTaggart. Um, he was at a barbecue in his neighborhood and talking to a Google engineer and it occurred to him, wow, Google has a lot of data about me. He made his money in real estate, not in information. Um, and as they tell the story, he sort of thought on it. He's like, somebody should do something about this. And then it occurred to him, maybe that somebody is me. So he spent $3 million of his own money. He uh, convened some experts to write a, um, a privacy ballot initiative and got enough signatures to get it on the ballot. So it would have been on the ballot November of um, 2018. Yeah, November of last year. And this was a, you know, a multi-year process. Um, the challenge with the California ballot initiative is that once into place, it can't be changed. It can only be repealed. And um, the ballot initiative would have asked something like, are you in favor of privacy? You know, who says no to that? So uh, its odds for passage were quite good. Um, so there was kind of a rising sense of panic among Silicon Valley and, and kind of the Northern California companies there. And they reached a deal last summer with the governor and with McTaggart's group, where if we could get legislation and the governor promises to sign it, will you withdraw the ballot initiative? So if you look at the timeline there, the CCPA was introduced June 21st. 
it was signed into law on June 28th. There was a weekend in there. So it was about four business days um, between the law's introduction and it becoming um, signed into law by the governor. The draft is poorly worded, full of mistakes, uh, has already been amended once in September to correct some errors, um, but it is now the subject of very, very fierce lobbying up and down uh, California. Um, they're doing a series of what they're calling listening tours. I think the last one wrapped up this week where they went to eight cities and they had like town hall meetings and you could come to the open mic and provide comments about it. Um, the attorney general's office is tasked with regulations for implementing it and the law is, it is confusing on its face. There are terms that aren't defined. There are terms that appear in one part and nowhere else in the CCPA. It's going to be a very tough law to implement. Um, just some key concerns about it. Uh, it's the breadth. So it is now the broadest definition globally of personal information. It includes not just information that's associated with an individual or a device, but also a household. So um, data associated with the household would be considered personal information, would be protected. It has a big list of specific examples and includes, everyone likes this one, olfactory profiles. So if you have people smell what they smell, that's personal. Uh, so data that previously was considered anonymized or pseudonymized, all is swept under the law. Um, it adds kind of European style requirements uh, for, on a large scale for the first time. So individuals do have that right of access. They would have a right of deletion. And when you think about how broad this idea of personal information is, you would be scanning systems left and right to make sure you comply with these requests. Um, there are also kind of affirmative website requirements. Any site that sells data and sale is any exchange of data for consideration, they have to put a large button on the homepage that says, do not sell my personal information. Um, you also have to have a 1-800 number. You have to provide information back to individuals through online accounts. So there's a lot of compliance infrastructure that has to be built around the CCPA, um, which leads to operational challenges, of course. And they have added a private right of action for data breaches with statutory penalties. So there's going to be a new class action risk associated with California data breaches. Okay, but who does the CCPA apply to? Um, any company that does business in California and meets one of the following standards, so either gross revenue over $25 million a year, um, collects or shares personal information annually from 50,000 consumers, households, or devices. I personally have, I don't know, three to five devices. I bet everybody in this room does. So this tends to be the prong that catches even smaller, medium-sized businesses. Or you derive at least 50% of your an annual revenue from the sale of personal information. And just so you can see the definitions here, it applies to consumers, which is any natural person. So it does include employees. Uh, and HR data, and the definition there of personal information. So anything that can be um, dis identifies, relates to, describes, capable of being associated with or could reasonably be linked with a consumer or household, full stop. But for this crowd, here is the relevant slide. Who is a business? Um, they cite another definition in the California Code uh, as to who is a business. And as you'll see there, you, it is a for-profit entity only. So everybody in this room can breathe a sigh of relief um, because you are not a covered business under the CCPA. Uh, however, we want to say that you can be swept in by your affiliation with a for-profit who is a covered business. Uh, and there are some factors there. So if that may apply to you, it's something you want to think through. Has, has affiliate been defined in this? I don't think so. No. Okay. No. Okay, but don't stop listening because <laughs> <laughs> the CCPA really is going to be the topic this year. And I think, as we saw with GDPR, you know, if you're an organization who took the position it doesn't apply, there was a lot of education of service providers, people that put a contract in front of you and say, everybody has to sign this, right? So there may be some education with the vendors that you work with that the CCPA doesn't apply to you. Um, what's it going to require if it did? Um, consumers have rights to request information about your practices as well as a copy of specific pieces of information that you hold about that consumer. There are deletion rights. 
there's a right to opt out of sales. There's this do not sell my personal information link that I mentioned. Um, there's something that doesn't exist under the GDPR, which is a non-discrimination provision. So uh, businesses are not allowed to discriminate against consumers, discriminate in the form of lower prices uh, if the consumer declines to give them personal information. So uh, this kind of a big impact on things like loyalty programs, uh, which is that's the value exchange um, that's, that is at the heart of loyalty programs. Um, the breach notification penalties are effective January 1, 2020. The rest of the law becomes effective six months after regulations are promulgated or July 1st, whichever comes first. Do you know if there's been any discussion about um, opening it up to nonprofits? There has been. So the attorney general continues to push for broader authority. He wants a private right of action for all aspects of the law. Um, and there are there are a lot of proposals uh, that are on the table. So okay. we're kind of watching to see what develops, but also working with companies on implementation. Um, there are some exceptions. And again, we're trying to give you just a 50,000 foot view in case anyone asks you about the CCPA specifically. The exceptions are not particularly helpful or specific. Uh, most of them go with either, you know, law enforcement or legal claims. Um, and it doesn't apply to conduct outside of California, um, personal information that's aggregate or de-identified. But the threshold for that, the definitions are really high. Um, and in fact, the definition of publicly available information, which is something you often see carved out of privacy laws, is incredibly narrow. So it only includes information that's provided by a government agency for the purpose for which it was provided. So even if you were to buy voter registration data but use it for other purposes, it doesn't count as publicly available and is all subject to the law. Uh, the CCPA is going to be enforced by the California Attorney General. Um, right now, there's a 30-day cure period, and the Attorney General can seek uh, civil penalties for the law, but there is no private right of action for the privacy aspects of it. Uh, there's no cap, though, on the Attorney General's civil penalties, um, and they get all the money, so they really are incentivized um, on the enforcement front. Um, Let's see, rulemaking by July 1, 2020, which we mentioned. Uh, and there's a number of specific places where it calls for the Attorney General um, to promulgate regulation. So there's a lot we're waiting to, to understand about this law. Just the last thing to mention, there is a private right of action for data breaches. It takes the existing definition of breach from California, so that's not being expanded. It will still only apply to name, plus social security number or driver's license number or government ID number, et cetera. Um, so this broader idea of personal information is not moved over to the breach statute, um, but it does add a uh, private right of action with statutory penalties. I believe it's $250 per individual affected or $750 for a um, willful violation. Okay. So we're seeing a lot of reaction in the U.S. to the California law. Um, there is, as you can imagine, a pretty heavy push for a preemptive federal comprehensive privacy law. Um, we're also continuing to see Congress introduce kind of specific laws in areas like social media, um, geolocation data. But there are a couple conflicting proposals now for comprehensive federal privacy legislation. And what I will mention here is that every proposal we've seen would give the FTC jurisdiction over nonprofits um, with respect to privacy. So that will be a pretty big change um, for, for this sector. None of them are really moving because not a lot is moving through Congress right now. Um, and it remains to be seen whether it can happen before uh, it seems like the half of the Senate's running for president. So before kind of the election really heats up and, and folks leave and they're not voting. But there's going to be definitely a lot of talk about privacy. There have been a number of hearings already this year. Um, so we have to see. But uh, the FTC is pushing very strongly for authority over nonprofits in the privacy area. And then we're seeing a lot of states uh, kind of introduce privacy bills right now. Um, there is the California model, which we've talked about, which has these access, deletion, opt-out rights. And then there's another model, what we're calling the Washington State model. It's a more GDPR-based model. 
has kind of the full scope of GDPR rights, including data portability. You can object to data being used for marketing purposes or for profiling. And it would require things like risk assessments for vendors and also, you know, contracts with vendors and service providers. Um, this, this bill does apply to nonprofits. Um, I think the expectation is that, um, let me see, I think it's on the next slide. Yeah, so two thirds of the states will propose some form of omnibus privacy legislation this year. And then there are predicting five to seven bills with a realistic chance of actually moving or coming into effect. Washington is one, Oregon is one, New York, New Jersey, um, I think New Mexico maybe. So there are a lot of proposals out there and uh, a lot of, there's a lot of lobbying in a lot of the states, um, but we're gonna, end up with some kind of privacy patchwork, just like we have on breach and, and data security, unfortunately, unless there's a federal, a federal bill comes in to save the day. I have nothing to add but fear, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so. All oh, right, so <laughs> moving out of privacy into data breach, this is everyone else's least favorite topic. Um, if you haven't been keeping score, there are now breach laws in all 50 states. Thank you, Mississippi, bringing up the rear. And these state laws do continue to evolve. Uh, what we're, we're seeing is tinkering around the edges. So the definition of what's covered in a breach, you know, people started adding medical, and then there are now 12 or so states that talk about email accounts or online accounts. Um, so this definition just, it creeps. Uh, and again, in the absence of kind of a single federal standard. And I think the data breach provisions in the GDPR are also helping to kind of push this debate forward. Um, as we see states kind of tinker with their breach laws, they're also adding affirmative security provisions. Uh, so more requirements to have appropriate security put into place. And this really is resulting in things like risk allocation and commercial contracts. Um, and I think we'll probably see, again, a change in the contractual landscape just in reaction to the CCPA because you have a whole new liability scheme or regime that's out there. And contracts, of course, are gonna be the way to deal with that and try to shift the costs. So we're not seeing it quite yet, but there's a lot of talk about that. In terms of a breach, and I know it's it's on um, my mind constantly. Um, if you think you've had an incident, and and I've been warned not to use you know breach or you know a, a you know a cyber incident or whatever. Um, in your mind, what are the first three or four steps that somebody should take um, as in-house counsel uh, once you think you've had something going on? Well, hopefully you have an incident response plan and they are going to really um, set forth who has what tasks. So IT is obviously going to have a role, a pretty prominent role in the early parts, but you want to make sure that they're overseen by legal to protect privilege. You can bring an outside counsel that helps with privilege as well. And then things like marketing, communications, um, whatever division is going to have the relationship. So if it's HR data, right, HR should be read in. If it's uh, external or kind of customer data, the, the right folks there should be read in. Um, we're seeing just a push for speed, right? Mm -hmm. So when state AGs send back an inquiry, even it's a very kind of form inquiry, um, whenever you have to report it to an attorney general, the first question is always explain the fill in the blank. Why did it take you 13 days, 30 days, you know, between the discovery and when the letter went out? So we're seeing it in the laws themselves. Uh, some laws have a timeline as short as 30 days now for reporting. We've seen proposals for as short as 10 days. Um, there's always going to be a question though about why you don't get it done faster. So making sure the right people in, who know their roles is really helpful. And, you know, tabletop exercises are something we recommend for organizations where you come in and you run a mock breach scenario and all the right people are in the room and they kind of act out their part and it helps flesh out who, um, needs more clarity around what their role is uh, when time is of the essence. And I would also add, um, according to our insurance company, they've told us, you know, notify them early and often. Right. Um, 
you know, the, I would also, if you have a duty to defend policy, which means you've got a, they've got a panel of, of outside counsel that you're supposed to use, try and get the counsel that you're most comfortable with onto that panel or at least work out some sort of arrangement where you'll pay the difference, especially if your counsel really knows your business. You don't want somebody coming in out of the blue and, and trying to get up to speed uh, really quickly. Um, but uh, uh, insurance companies also have um, uh, other parties who they can bring in. They can bring in a breach coach. They can bring in forensics experts. Um, they can help manage the PR uh, and, and several other areas um, if, if you get dinged. So um, getting them on the phone as quickly as possible, I think, is also uh, incredibly important. Yeah, have your team in place, bottom line. Um, breaches continue to happen all the time. Just if it happens or has happened to your organization, know that you're not alone. Um, the, re the reporting, we've counted 2,200 breaches in 2017. That's probably dramatically under underestimated. Uh, we continue to see, just anecdotally, the phishing scheme, because it works um, over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, also versions of the W-2 scam, if you've heard about this. And this tends to affect smaller or medium-sized companies and organizations where it looks like it's an email. It usually goes to HR. It looks like it's from the CFO. It looks really good. And they say, hey, can you zip up all the W-2s and send them to me? And then um, when folks start to file their tax returns, they find that they've all been filed for them. So that... That's a mess, uh, but we kind of see the versions of the same schemes over and over again. So um, I'm a big fan of the, the mock phishing email as a way to test your organization. You can send one out and catch whoever it is who clicks on it and opens the attachment. Uh. <laughs> right. <laughs> we did that. We, um, we sent out right. some information, education, and then uh, I think it was two weeks later, sent out, uh, hired a company, um, to do the phishing exercise for us. And they sent out three different sets of emails over about a four or five day period. And several people were coming over and saying, what's going on? I got this strange email. But then you get the statistics of how many people open the email, how many people actually click through, and then unfortunately, how many people entered in their, um, their password and, and other information. That's the part that scares me the most. And all you need is one because then somebody creeps right. in your system and just sits there and grabs and does whatever they want. Yeah, that's right. I think I read somewhere that the average is 34 days when someone gets in your system before it's discovered. So that gives uh, an attacker a lot of time to, to get in, get information and get out. Um, in light of all this, just a continued emphasis on assessing your organization's vulnerabilities and risk uh, as industry best practices and standards have emerged, things like the NIST framework, they're all tailored to risk assessment. And we know that, um, again, if, if your practices are ever investigated, after they ask you, why did it take you so long? <laughs> if, they, if they go a level deeper, they will ask to see copies of your information security policies. They'll ask about your employee training. These are all aspects of a good risk management program um, in the cyberspace. So... You know, there are pretty comprehensive assessments where you do interviews and a lot of training. There are kind of streamlined versions. You have to find the one that's right for your industry for the data you hold. But uh, we continue to advocate for um, testing your systems. Okay. It's actually uh, hackers, ethical hackers. Um, I just read something that a uh, kid in Argentina, I think he's 17 or 18 years old, just became the first millionaire off of ethical hacking. Uh, I'm sure there's probably more than, than just him. Um, but you set up something in your system, and you only pay if they get there. So you get them, say, come on in, try and get into our system. And if they can get all the way to whatever assets you're trying to hide or keep secure, um, then you pay them 5000 or 10000 or whatever it is. Um, and if they can't, then they, then they don't get there. And then you cross your fingers that they truly are ethical. So, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll quickly tell you whether you've got uh, problems with your system, though. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, we actually made it to the end of to the end of the hour. We did. Any questions in the room? Any? Yep. Um, I have a question back to the California regulation. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> it's a, a nonprofit in California, or who has a lot of constituents in California, using a third party provider that is uh, hosting their data, the, their donation forms, the email signups, all of that. So they are a for-profit. That agency is a for-profit. That's right. Uh, so they, are, they fall under the regulations. Right. But because California doesn't have this processor controller role differentiation, uh, who? There is a definition of a service provider in the CCPA. And a service provider, it's, it's two prongs. They, they are like a data processor, right? So they're only providing services on behalf of their customer and the contract has to say so, um, you're right. They would be subject to it, but transfers of data are not disclosures for the purpose of the CCPA when you give them to a service provider. So when I said you're gonna see a lot of contractual activity, I think around defining service providers versus defining third parties or other businesses, um, that's where you may have an opportunity to educate some of your service providers because they may be trying to implode, impose or flow, you know, obligations to you that don't apply. So like you saw in the DPA context, it's like, here's our form, click it, you can't negotiate it. There, there's, for nonprofits, I think, um, there are conversations that are going to be had, that are going to have to be had with those service providers to say, this law doesn't apply to us. We don't need to do these things. Kelly, from uh, the, the risk management point, um, I heard, I don't know if you've heard this too, but some insurers under the cyber policy may actually pay for going through that, that NIST framework or, or pay the expenses involved in that yeah. um, as a test. Yeah. Um, yes, if you have good coverage. <laughs> right, right. So but check it, your coverage. Right, it's just like <laughs> medical insurance and paying for your checkups and your, your kind of wellness. So right. it makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. Any any other questions? Well, please join me in uh, thanking our panelists for a great uh, presentation today. Thank you.